Well, I was president of the, what was then the Division of Humanistic Psychology, uh, Division 32. And uh, my year, I felt that there was a need to start a, an annual conference. And so I made that my personal project. And we started the first conference in San Francisco. Uh, it was, it was, it was, <clears throat> it was a lot of fun because we were able to f get all the stars from all over the world to come and present. And um, so we had about 150 people. It was well attended, well received. And uh, the main thing was it was good enough to, to convince the board that we ought to continue this on an annual basis. And that was a, a little bit of a struggle initially because not everybody was on board. But after we did a few conferences, uh, they were so successful, not only because people had a chance to meet and learn in a collective community uh, in an area that they're all interested in, but because we made a community. So we, we also had a reference group of people that we felt connected to and we all, all often relate to between conferences and just from lifetime relationships and develop projects together. So it's, it's had a lot of good outcomes. So, yeah, so how do you feel about the conference now? Wait, wait till the train comes. The thing I think the conf conference does that we need in this field, whether it came from us or somebody else, is there is one place every year that the humanistic existential community can gather together and learn together uh, and share ideas, learn to take their profession further, develop ish work on projects and issues like social justice and so on. So there wasn't such a place and I just felt like we needed such a place. And now as you can see we get people from all over the world. One of the great things we do is we always have a lot of students at these conferences. So we get them encouraged and excited about what they're pursuing. Uh, because we tend to be a minority uh, in the field of psychology, they have a place to go where there's like-minded people and feel like there's support for their way of being and thinking and doing. What is your greatest fear and your greatest hope for humanistic psychology as we go forward in 2015? My biggest fear is that there are not of, enough of us in academia to teach the next generations of students because it's been my experience that when students are exposed to faculty who are well grounded in humanistic existential approaches and teach them, and especially teach them experientially, students like it. They have a sense of this is what therapy ought to look like, this is the kind of therapist I want to be. But my concern is that in the current zeitgeist, the cognitive behavioral are still, um, <clears throat> still too much at the top of the pile because students like it, it's, it's still trendy, it seems simplistic, and so on. Um, that, so my biggest concern is that we won't reproduce ourselves unless we stay in academia long enough. And I think that was one of the mistakes Rogers made. He left academia, a lot of clients and people left academia with him, and then there was no longer enough of us to reproduce the next generations. Um, that's my biggest concern. My biggest hope is that was the other part. That we will become more vital players in the culture in general. Sorry. Hold on one second. Okay, thank you. So, what is your greatest <clears throat> because hope? In wait, wait, start on it. My greatest hope? My greatest hope is that humanistic psychology gets to the places where it's needed the most, like our Congress. If they would do simple things like learning to be present with each other, learning to listen, learning to understand individual differences, learning to be cooperative and collaborative and, and not so polarized, learning to see the person's point of view and acknowledge that it has merit. And, and in other organizations engage the same kind of things. I think humanistic psychologists have a place in the workplace. Because a typical work, worker feels underappreciated and dehumanized. And if we bring our models into the workplace, not only can we make the workplace better, but on the business person's end, productivity will go up because you've got happier campers willing to work harder 
because you care about them and you get them to care about their cause. So I think we need to get into the culture more and, and have a voice that's heard because we can be transformative uh, in ways that are very critical to our culture thriving. And it really, it really does worry me that on the other end of that, that we have become a very polarized culture. Even on the level of talk shows, it's this point against that point. And everybody wants to make an opinion and defend their opinion as opposed to understanding that opinions are starting points for dialogue. And maybe that's another thing we, we can bring. We can bring dialogue. Whether it's on the level of a conference or in an individual family, we can bring dialogue where people will listen to, her and appreciate different points of view. Great. So just very quickly, when you look at the state of the world, when you see how much atrocity is going on, human against human, how does humanistic psychology speak to that? Well, the first word that came to mind was empathy. When you can behead someone so casually you have failed to connect to that person as another sentient, feeling human being. You have distanced yourself. You have objectified that person. If you can empathize with that person and see yourself in that person, you can't behead them. Because you see that they have the same rights and same needs and are much more like you than different from you. But as long as you continue to do us and them, it's much easier to be violent and hold on to your position as right and the others as wrong and then we get into another polarization where there's no meaning of minds but empathy is critical because it's a fundamental basis of dialogue.